We are the company CS Instruments. We are manufacturer of proven and innovative measuring technology for compressed air and other gases. Today we will hear um, a little webinar um, about flow and the consumption measurement. Today's agenda will be as follows. So first of all, we will hear a little bit about our company, about our company profile, who is CS Instruments, who are we, who are I am, me, my person. And after that, we will go through the questions. First of all, why is it important to monitor your consumption? So what advantage you will get from the measurement? What is flow? So what kind of different types of flow do we have and where are the differences? What do we need to measure properly in field? What we have to be sure of? Uh, we will see uh, different measuring principles from CS instruments. For example, on the on one hand, the thermal mass flow principle, and on the other hand, the differential pressure type flow measurement principle. We will see where are the advantages or where are the differences also between the two measuring principles. And uh, yes, we will just enlighten them a little bit further. After that, we will see uh, different solutions and applications, what we can offer and where we can serve our devices. We will see differences of the uh, flow meter CS Instruments offers, and we will see different measuring points in a compressed air system and where we recommend to measure the compressed air consumption and what kind of device you should use. After that, we will hear a little bit about the integration in a network and about the different output signals we are able to offer. Yes, first of all, a little bit um, about our company. So the company is medium sized, owner managed and innovative. We got founded in 2002 from two uh, managing directors. Um, it was Christian Schultz and Wolfgang Plessing. In the meantime, unfortunately, Christian Schultz died and now we have one sole managing director. It's Wolfgang Blessing. Wolfgang Blessing is um, also stes is also located in the location south. You can see it here on the right picture on the lower right picture. Um, the location south is basically in the southwest of Germany, and it's um, really close to the border of France and Switzerland. So to both co countries, we have one hour to drive approximately. And then we have another another location in Germany. It's almost at Danish border, so really far in the north of Germany. It's in Harrisley. And on the lower left picture, you can also see this company building from the north. We have approximately 100 staff members globally at this moment. Approximately 20 of them are engineers, external and internal ones. So my name is Florian Buchner. You can see my my contact details here on the right corner, upper right corner, my email address as well as our home page, home page address, our web page details. You are welcome to contact us every time via the info ad, or you can also contact me directly um, through my email. Yes. So. We not only produce and we are not only manufacture flow meters, we also have other different measuring principles or measuring devices in our in our, port, in our product range. For example, devices to prove the efficiency of your compressors. So this would be on the one hand power meters to see, okay, what is the power consumption of this compressor? And uh, so where are my peaks, where are my lows? And on the other hand, a flow meter to install directly at the outlet of the compressor to see, okay, this is my power consumption. I will produce this amount of compressed air with this amount of energy. And then we can clearly see the efficiency of the compressor and how it develop over the time. Will it get better? Even not. Will it get worse? Maybe maybe it will get worse and this is also what, what what we can control here so we can see okay over the time we need more energy to produce the same amount of air or we need even more energy to produce a less amount of air 
what would be a really bad situation. And this is what we can measure. We can directly see what power we consume, what, what is my energy consumption, what is my product, what is my compressed air production in the end. So we can directly calculate our compressed air costs as well, because every time we know really accurate how or what we have to pay for our energy, for our current. Yes. So we have dew point meters and you residual humidity uh, meters to check if your dryers are still working properly and to to see okay what is my what is my humidity content in my compressed air after my treatment after my dryers after my filtration this is also a big part of the quality measurement according to ISO 8573 where we not only have to check our residual um, residual humidity content but also our residual oil and residual particle content this is basically also one application cover both cover all three particle oil and humidity measurement device we have a big and wide range of flow meters and 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 different kind of flow meters for different applications for example insertion type flow meters to install in your main pipe or as well inline type inline type flow meters to install in your compressed air distribution for example with lower pipe diameters and we also offer manufacture and produce and also developed in-house um, leak detectors ultrasonic leak detectors to search for your for leakage in your compressed air system accurately so but why is um, the consumption measurement so important now so first of all we have a little example for you prepared um, where you can see what's the specific what's what's the cost and what and what and where are our potential savings or saving potentials so first of all we have the example we have a compressor with a capacity of 16 cubic meters per minute or what equals to 960 cubic meters per hour our utilization rate is 80 percent our electrical connected load is 100 kilowatts and our annual operating time so our annual working hours are 8760 hours we therefore have energy costs of 8760 hours multiplied with 80 kilowatts because we have an utilization rate of 80 percentage multiplied with 0 0.15 euro so 0 0.5 euro is the cost for one kilowatt in germany and this equals to 105,100 20 euros per year um, regarding our electricity cost and this is only regarding one compressor so we know from experience and we know from our customers so the leakage rate are approximately in germany 20 to 30 percent of our total consumption so 20 to 30 percent of our total consumption equals to about 26,280 euros per year which we could potential save and this is only because of leaks in our compressed air system this would equal to uh, uh, co co2 or carbon dioxide dioxide em emission of approximately 75 tons so what what we can see in this example really is so compressed air is expensive but other gases such as nitrogen oxygen or argon for example are still much much more expensive so and also in this kind of systems we are able to measure and we are also able to measure leak rates and we also see what happens with um, a system with another gas it doesn't have to be compressed air all the time our flow meters also can handle different other kinds of gases and what we really can see 
after we measure for a specific time with the flow meter, for example, in the main pipe. So this diagram is, for example, a real measurement on in field from one of our customers. This is done in the main pipe with one of our thermal mass flow meters. And you basically can, first of all, see uh, a curve. So uh, nothing special. But if you investigate this diagram further, you will see, okay, for example, I have a really high peak, a really high uh, compressed air consumption or a really high compressed air demand here at um, this specific time span. Maybe it's in a night shift or in a day shift, I don't know exactly, but it helps us to determine when we have the highest demand of compressed air and it also helps us to decide, do we have to optimize our compressed air production? Maybe we need another compressor, or maybe we have also to optimize our demand side. And what we also see is the lower peaks or the lower offset flows. For example, we, we exactly know in this time, red market here below, we didn't have any compressed air consumption because we didn't have any production. This was a weekend time. So, but we see also in weekend times when we don't have any consumption, we still have a consumption. And this consumption is not because there are compressed air users or there are machines running. This is basically because of leaks. So we will still, we will every time have a little offset flow. So if we wouldn't have this one, this little offsets here or our leaks, basically, then the whole curve would um, would come a little bit more down. And that means our average consumption would be also down. So this offset is every time calculated to our consumption in any case. Every time we we consume compressed air, we consume this amount. It's about 350 cubic meters. You can see it is approximately. It's not not 100% sure. It's between 350 and 400 cubic meters. You will every time have this one as well because of leaks. And now we see, okay, our average leakage rate here below, or our average consumption over this time is about 600 cubic meters. And when we have already 350 up to 400 cubic meters of leaks, which are every time there, but every time not to run our our machines, but every time to 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 flow out in the air, basically compressed air is produced for nothing here. We see, okay, if we have an approximately consumption of 600 cubic meters and an average leakage flow of about 350 up to 400, then we can easily calculate it's up to 65, up to 70% leaks in my system because an average of 600 and an offset flow was 350 about we, every time we, we have a leakage rate here in this case for of about 65%. So we can directly go further and see at the and install one flow meter, one more flow meter at directly in front of the process or directly inside of machines or in front of machines. And then we can clearly see, okay, this um, maybe is only one leaking machine, which we that we see in our in our general measurement in our main lines so maybe we see okay this is the this is the path we see this is one building which has a higher offset leak flow than the other ones and we see also okay directly in front of this machine we installed a flow meter directly in front of this machine and this machine is leaking very very um very very much so we also can calculate and determine our compressed air costs um, for our specific processes. If we install one flow meter in front of each machine, we can also clearly see how how much um, compressed air needs this uh, machine. In this way, we can calculate also how much compressed air costs are, are used or are needed for producing one product of these goods, for example. And the leakage rate of the machine, yes. So, but what is flow now exactly? 
how can we um, how can we explain it or where and where are the differences so depending on the density and the viscosity and the pipe diameter and the velocity of the air the flow is either laminar or turbulent um, we have here a little picture, a little visualization. Um, on the left side, you can see a laminar flow. You see the streamlines are really um, are straight and quiet. They are calm, so the flow is really uh, um, defined. So it's really um, it, it is defined. So every streamline transports um, specific molecules on one on a straight way for example so we can clearly calculate this flow we can clearly say what what happens next where's my highest velocity where's my lo lowest velocity um, compared to a turbulent flow which occurs if we for example have disturbing elements in our flow or a too high velocity and a specific um, combination of density viscosity then we will get a turbulent flow and a turbulent flow is not really nice to measure your consumption or you, to measure your flow values because it's not defined. Because you cannot clearly say what happens next. You cannot clearly say where's my highest, highest velocity, where's my lowest velocity. It's basically turbulent and it's um, really it's basically just not defined. And to calibrate our devices properly and also to measure in field, later properly we every time have to enable a laminar flow because we every time have to achieve um, comparable um, comparable situations in field as also while the calibration so while calibration and while measuring in field basically the the um, the status should be uh, should be similar or should be really similar so we every time need a laminar flow and with a laminar flow profile, the highest, highest velocity every time occurs in the middle of the pipes. So towards the edges of the pipes at the boundary layer here in this area, the, the velocity basically approaches to zero. And we also have, every, or in the most cases, like a parabolic shape, a parabolic flow profile, where we can clearly see, okay, the highest velocity occurs in the middle of our pipes. And if we have a state like this, if we have a laminar flow like this, we can calculate it and we can clearly see, okay, the highest velocity occurs in the middle of our pipes. A laminar flow get calculated um, due to our velocity, which occurs in our pipes and the area, the pipe area, and also a specific factor for the time. Mm. So we every time want to measure in a laminar flow profile and we every time wants to measure in the middle of the pipes because there we have the highest velocity and then we exactly can calculate the average flow due to um, several flow profile factors depending on the pipe diameter and other factors. So how can we enable a laminar flow on site? Mm, there are different cases. For example, we have a pipe diameter reduction or we have 90 degree um, elbows, for example, or tri tri three dimensional elbows or some valves or some ball valves in front of the flow meter. Every kind of this constellation could lead to a turbulence, could lead to turbulences. So for example, if we reduce our pipe diameter, the velocity will increase um, directly. And therefore, if we have an increase in the velocity, we could have also turbulences later. So that's because we are specifying our, in our instruction manuals to give the flow meter every time a specific section a specific length of a straight inlet or straight outlet in order to 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 relax the flow to laminar our flow to uh, to be sure that we don't have turbulences um, at our at our sensor elements and that's um, and that's described in our manuals and um, to, to every specific case, we have an example, and these are basically the, the, the minimum values we are recommend 
if you have the options to let longer inlet sections or longer outlet sections as well, it is every time recommendable because as longer the inlet and as longer the outlet, as as more sure we can be that the flow well the, the flow is is laminar and not turbulent anymore. So this is, for example, a negative um, a negative example. We can see. There's one time a ball valve directly in front of the sensor. Then we have a pipe reduction here from this area to this area. We have again a pipe expansion and the same on the outlet as well. Pipe reduction, pipe expansion, valve. This is basically the, the worst thing you can do because we not only have a reduction in pipe diameter, also we have sharp edges inside our, our pipes and sharp edges also every time could lead to turbulences. So this is what we are not want to do. If we order a flow meter, for example, VA520 here in two and a half inch, for example, we need the same diameter, the same diameter in inlet and in the outlet section. We cannot um, install an inlet section with another diameter. This is impossible. So our flow meters, especially our insertion type flow meters, are really easy to install. Basically, they are they are insert able via uh, a half inch ball valve, a standard ball valve. They are install able under pressure. So you don't have to shut down your complete, complete compressed air system to install one of our flow meter in the main pipe. So this is also impossible for some companies which have a 24-7 a, a production. So they cannot just go and, and, and shut down the compressed air system because we want to install a flow meter. But this is also not necessary. We can insert our flow meters directly um, over a half inch ball valve under pressure. And this works as follow. So first of all, we connect the flow meter with the ball valve. It is still closed, you saw it. Then if we have a tight connection, we can open our ball valves because we are tight now. Insert our flow meters on the side of our flow meters, on the shaft of our flow meters, there's an insertion depth scale. So with a little um, calculation, you can directly see uh, where or, or how deep you have to insert the flow meters um, in order that the sensor tip sits in the middle of the pipe because we have the highest velocity in the middle of the pipe. So fix the flow meter, tighten it, finish, installed under pressure. This is possible with our with our flow meters, and we also have special drilling jigs to drill a hole under pressure to create the measuring section. Exactly. So, but how do we now measure the flow? So we have two different different principles. One is the thermal mass flow principle. Why CS Instruments choose this measuring principle? because it's on the one hand ideal for low speed applications. So we have flow meters, they start to measure up from 0.05 meters per second. But on the other hand, we also can cover really high flow rates up to 224 meters per second. So you will get one flow meter to cover two applications, one flow meter to measure on the one hand your leakage flows in production three times. On the other hand, you can detect your, your, your general consumption, your um, your peaks as well as your average consumption of your compressed air system, of your whole compressed air system. Yes, we are very accurate in the lower ranges as well as in the higher ranges. So the measuring um, principle is ideal for both and ideal for dry and processed compressed air. So the thermal mass flow meters has to be installed after our compressed air um, processing, after our dryers, after our filters. But how does it work now? So basically we have two sensors and um, two sensors um, with our flow meters. You can see it here on the right pictures. There's two sensor tips, basically two platinum resistors, two heating elements. So the first heating element, air one, heats up to a specific 
temperature um, according to R2. R2 is measuring the, the, the temperature of the gas which is flowing by. So L1 every time heats up to a specific delta, let's say about 10 degrees Celsius. R1 is every time 10 degrees Celsius hotter as R2. So for that, we every time have to, uh, to, um, to supply um, heating current, heating current in order to heat up R1. So if we now have a flow and if we now have gas flowing by the sensor elements, the heat is also transported away. And if we transport heat away from R1, for example, R1 who wants to stay on a specific delta um, compared to R2, then we have to uh, supply more, more heating current to R1 as usual. As higher our flow, as higher our velocity now is, as more heating current we have to supply to R1. And therefore, we every time know, okay, with this specific amount of heating current, we have this specific amount of velocity. So our heating current is basically an indicator for our mass flow. And our mass flow, because we are pressure and temperature compensated with this measuring principle. As higher our density, as higher our mass flow will be, as higher our mass flow will be, as higher the cooling effect to our sensor elements will be because we have more molecules passing by the sensor element. And then the heat will be transported away even more, um, even more, yes. And therefore, as higher our mass flow really is, as higher also our, our heating current is, we have to supply to our heating elements. And that's because the thermal mass flow meter is uh, basically a measuring principle where we measure the mass flow. And if we measure the mass flow, we can every time calculate back to every reference we want to. For example, 1000 millibars and 20 degrees Celsius to keep it comparable. So, but we don't only have determined mass flow meters in our portfolio, we also have differential pressure types flow meters in our portfolio. Why? Because they are ideal for hot and wet conditions. So the thermal mass flow meters, like I explained the principle to you, if we have R1 heated up, for example, and we would have a water drop on R1, then we would have a much, much different cooling effect to R1 as we would have if we have dry compressed air. So if we have condensate at our sensor tips, the thermal mass flow principle is not, um, it's, it's not usable anymore. For that, we have another flow meter principle or another flow meter, this is the, the VD500. It works according to the differential pressure principle. So it is ideal for hot and wet conditions. We don't have any problems uh, to install this flow meter directly after our compressors before our treatment, before our dryers. So, and with this kind of flow meter, we can also measure our FAD. And this is basically this type of flow meter we use if we want to see, or if we want to prove the efficiency of our compressors. If we want to see, okay, how, or how high is the flow our compressor really can produce. Then you have to insert it directly after your compressors and then you have to use another different, another principle, not the thermal mass flow meters anymore. So, but how is it working? So we have an integrated precise differential pressure sensor um, in, uh, equipped in this sensor. Mm, we measure not only the, the, the static pressure, so our system pressure, we also measure the dynamic pressure in this case. The dynamic pressure increases if the velocity increases. So the dynamic pressure is basically the pressure on one specific point. So as higher my flow will be, as higher my differential pressure will be on my sensor element. In front, we will have a much, much higher pressure as behind our sensor elements. And this is basically also an indicator for our volume flow. So the flow is therefore easy determined by means of the diameter. So if we 
know in which diameter we sit and if we know okay this is the this is the differential pressure then we can calibrate these devices to a specific velocity and we will measure our flow values afterwards properly also with this kind of of measuring principle vd500 you can see here on the right picture a uh, picture from the sensor element we don't have these two heating elements anymore. We basically only have one hole on the on on the one side and one hole of the opposite side. Yes, and we have different solutions for our flow meters. We have insertion type flow meters to measure in main pipes up to DN1000 and also more. This is um, individual and request able. We can determine we can uh, determine our general compressed air costs and we also can allocate them and we also able we are also able to investigate leakage flows yes but we also have stationary solutions to install directly in front of our processes or of our machines these are the inline sensors and for example also the compact inline sensors VA520 with flange connection or VA570 with ATEX certification for example for biogas applications as well as for I don't know natural gas applications VA520 for clean gas applications such as argon or nitrogen oxygen or also compressed air applications in general. The VA521 and the VA522 are our compact inline flow meters to install either directly in front of the process or directly in front or inside machines or to use it when we don't have enough space to install a flow meter, an inline flow meter like VA520 or 570. Yes, specific applications are, for example, compressed air consumption of weaving looms, uh, the gas consumption in breweries, or biogas con or, the, or consumption measurement in the biogas production. But we also have mobile solutions, so we don't only have stationary solutions, we also have insertion type flow meters and mobile chart recorders, for example, to analyze um, a compressed air system during the operation or a, a complete plant analysis um, during the operations and also leakage analysis in mobile applications for service technicians, for example, as well as for I don't know, um, people who are offering audits, for example, yes. So, but which flow meter should be used when and what are the differences? So, first of all, we have the series VA550, 570 and 521. VA550 in certain types equal to VA500, but with ATEC certification. So, what are the advantages from these flow meters? So we have an ATEX or an DVGW mm, approval. We can install them outdoor at outdoor application. They have a higher IP protection rate than our other flow meters. The IP protection rate with these flow meters is, seven, uh, is 67, not 65 like with the others. So we have a robust metal housing. Mm, and every time we have a high demand, of a clean surface, we also can take these flow meters because all wetted parts are made from stainless steel, also the sensor tips, and therefore we also can cover higher temperatures, higher than 100 degrees Celsius. So this kind of flow meters are recommended for explosive and for dirty gases, for example, like natural gas, propane or hydrogen. And, but, they are also available for compressed air. So, for example, if there or if we have an outdoor installation or if we have the need of a higher IP protection class. So we have 500, 520, 525. Um, these sensors are only for the indoor uh, installation recommended for technical clean gases such as compressed air, clean compressed air, nitrogen, argon, oxygen, or carbon dioxide, helium. And these kind of flow meters are here on the right side. 
insertion types as well as inline types with flange connection or with Frieden connection and compact flow meters also available. And then we have the VD500. It's uh, He's alone. He is a, like a special flow meter because we have another measuring principle, and we basically only have one application where we recommend this type type of flow meter, and this is the FAD measurement. The use directly after your compressor, the installation directly at the outlet of your compressor, uh, before your dryers, before your compressed air treatment. So, and which flow meter should be used where? So, first of all, VD500, wet air directly after your compressors. Then we have the VA500 insertion type in our main pipe to investigate our leakage flows, but also our total consumption. Then we have VA520 inline types in our compressed air distribution. We have a VA520 and bi directional measurement measured from both, both directions installed in our ring line and for each process or in front of each machine we also installed in VI525 and this is how we would recommend to install the flow meters in order to see exactly so where's my highest demand where's my highest leakage flows and what are my compressors doing here at the beginning so but not only the flow meters can be installed in your system and you can read the values out from the display. No, we every time have um, different output signals as a standard and we can offer also others as an option to integrate these flow meters also in an energy monitoring system. For example, in any SCADA or in any BMS system. So every time um, available with our flow meters is Modbus RTU RS485 and digital output signal and digital protocol, 4 to 20 milliamperes for your flow values or end and pulse output for your um, for your accumulated cubic meters. Available on request is Modbus TCP, for example, and also P the, the POE option, so power over Ethernet, and MBUS. And yes, this, this type of um, output signals help to integrate these flow meters in basically any kind of energy monitoring system. Okay, so I saw we overshooted our time on two minutes. This was my presentation. I hope you liked it. Thanks for your attention. You are welcome to send me questions, to send also your questions to the info ad. We will share the webinar with you later, the presentation as well as the, the video. Yes, thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.